In London, technology is the Silicon Roundabout. Introducing a new talk show dedicated to the people of the London technology startup scene. Silicon Real. Each week, interviewing entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, financial technology, accelerators, and incubators in an exciting three-person format. Learn about the people behind the innovation. Locally filmed, locally sourced. Silicon Real. It's about the people. This is Silicon Real, the uh, talk show dedicated to the people of the London technology startup scene. I'm Brian Rose. My guest today is Nicolas Brousson, who is the co-founder and COO of Blah Blah Car, a company which connects drivers with empty seats to people looking for a ride. Blah Blah Car is the most active ride-sharing community in Europe with over 10 million members and growing at 2 million per quarter. You've just raised a uh, fairly large $100 million round led by Index Ventures with uh, existing investor Excel Partners and a few others. Uh, prior to Blah Blah Car, you were a venture capitalist and before that you uh, had a front row seat for the 1999 tech bubble uh, in Silicon Valley. So I want to hear more about that, but uh, Nicholas, welcome to Silicon Real. Yep, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Before we get to Blah Blah Car, I have to ask you about uh, your experiences, you know, for that bubble. You know, you're in Silicon Valley, probably very few, you know, Frenchmen had that experience. And, and I was wondering if you've taken that and applied that to now running, you know, a very large European company. Is it, were there some takeaways there? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, so, so for me, what happened is I finished my studies, uh, as you said, in 99, 2000. Uh, and I moved to California, actually, uh, to Berkeley to finish my studies. Uh, and that was like a crazy time, except I had no reference, so I didn't know it was a crazy time. So, so you arrive in Silicon Valley or in, in Berkeley back then, and everybody was talking about startups and getting stock options and starting a company and fundraising and getting venture capital money. And all of that w was new to me. I mean, like, you know, and, and you have to walk back in time. And as a French engineer in the late 90s, startup was sort of a new thing. Venture capital was unknown to me. Uh, even Silicon Valley was kind of unknown to me, right? So. Uh, so you end up in this crazy environment, and and I went there actually to do a PhD back so then. So you went to Berkeley for a PhD. Well, I, I wanted to do a PhD in the U.S., so I was finishing my master degree um, in uh, so it was uh, from from France, and I finished that uh, in Berkeley doing an internship essentially, uh, and then I got caught into this whole uh, startup thing of late '99, early 2000, and and I worked in uh, in one of the hot space of the time, which was fiber optics. Okay. So, so essentially you had, you, you had the, the internet bubble and you had the telecom bubble uh, going with it, which was like building all this infrastructure for internet and the future of internet. Um, and then I had a very interesting ride. So I worked for a, a couple of companies actually. Uh, and I've seen like a company going from, I was probably employee something like 30 something when I joined. And we went from 30 to 150 within like six months, raising $85 million. Uh, from Kleiner Perkins, more Davido, Intel Capital, I mean, some of the big names yeah. that still today, actually, yeah. of, of Silicon Valley. Um, by the way, not knowing at all who was, what was Kleiner Perkins or all these funds back then. Um, so we built that company, no revenue, uh, but we've built lots of IP and it was um, hiring tons of people. Uh, and then, of course, came uh, the dot com burst and came 9 11 and came 2002. Um, and I've seen these like waves of layoffs going from 150 to actually 10 employees uh, or 10, not even employees, like survivors, I would say, um, uh, in the middle of 2002 uh, when the company won Chapter 11. Uh, and then we had to restart uh, that company and we've regrown that company from, from, from its ashes, essentially, uh, to actually a fairly good company or revenue-making company by 2006. And you stayed on the whole time? So I stayed on. So I survived and stayed on. Wow. And Sounds like Ben Horowitz's story a bit. You know, he kind of rode through, you yeah. know, downsized. And, and, and it's, you, you learn a lot, actually, in, the, in this downturn, actually, because you, you have to become, I, everything is difficult, right? So, uh, uh, you know, essentially, like, fundraising becomes difficult when you, you could get $85 million a couple of years before, even a year before. Suddenly, you, you struggle to get two. Um, uh, when you were spending tons on like hiring and building factories and uh, and building IP, suddenly you're selling stuff on eBay actually to, to 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 do paychecks at the end of the month. So you know it brings you back to reality in a brutal way, right. uh, and it brings you back to the reality of, hey, at the end your your business needs to be sustainable, right? And uh, I mean, otherwise, 
uh, when the tide goes down and when, when the markets are tough, actually you realize that few companies actually stand still. Um, so it was interesting to go through this sort of crazy hype phase and then in a way like crazy downturn uh, that was so fast in a way, if you think of, uh, of the 2001, 2002 downturn, and then like rebuilding this company uh, over time. So of course you, you, you take some of that, I mean when you go to the next, um, next stage of your life and next stage of your career, uh, those are pretty good learnings. So you, you remember that you, when, um, I mean, sometimes it can get tough, right? So, so clearly it's something we, uh, we use at Babacar. And the, out of the three co-founders, actually, we're all pretty much from the same generation. So we all sort of lived through, we started during the bubble phase. Okay. So it's interesting because you, you carry those scars of, okay, careful. Right, so you probably scale a little, a little more carefully than some Others. Yeah, in a way, you try to make, I mean, you try to scale fast. I mean, the name of the game is still, you, right. you need to scale fast, you need to hire fast, you need to make fast decisions. Uh, but also, you, you become realistic about uh, you not burning too much cash, uh, fundraising when you can, uh, you making sure you, you, you need the economics of your business actually as sensible. So, so I always look at that. I always look at, you know, does it make sense, actually? Does it make sense? In a, in a wide sense, right? Does it make sense? For society, does it make sense as a company? Is it sustainable in the long run? Um, and if you think, you know, if you start feeling it is, actually, not only you can fundraise, but you can really accelerate, right? So that's what we that's what we're doing. Okay. So so we try to be careful not to you know, blow a big balloon that can blow up um, uh, in any downturn. You know, there's a famous uh, acronym ABC, always be closing. But when I talk to you, it's almost ABF, always be fundraising. And it sounds like you always keep a dialogue going with uh, investors, you know, when and when you're not and when you are fundraising. Earlier you said fundraising should be a video, not a snapshot. And I've never heard anyone say that. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a bit because I think that's a great lesson for people starting out or even people doing Series A, Series B rounds. Yeah, I think that you're right. I think it's something we've been doing and I guess it's also the experience of having worked as a VC for four years. So having seen the other side of the equation. So having been from venture-backed company to venture capital, in a way back to a venture-backed company, you understand the two sides of this ecosystem. And it's an ecosystem. So, so essentially, I think it really matters to talk to investors. Not that you should spend your life talking to investors, of course, but, but essentially it's like you know, if you need to raise money, Make sure you can pick your investors. Make sure they understand your story. Before well. they invest, they Be might help them. Invest. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I can't remember who was saying that, but there is this saying, which is like, if you, um, uh, if you want to raise money, ask for advice. Uh, <laughs> if you want advice, ask for money. And, uh, <laughs> and in a way, it's true. I mean, if, if you go to, to great investors and you say, well, look, here's what we're building. Um, uh, here's the next step. Uh, it might not be, we might be too early stage for, for you guys for now, but you know, that's, that's, where we, we're trying to, that's what we're trying to build. What do you think we should do? Who do you think we should talk to? Actually, most people would help you, right? Mm -hmm. And they would like invest time and, and emotionally get um, get sort of tied into into your story. Uh, and then the day they invest, again, it's not like a picture that they're just discovering on uh, on that day, thinking like, oh, should I invest? Should I not invest? They've seen like an old movie of how you've built the company, how you delivered, the problems you had, the solution you found. Um, and when, when they join the adventure. Uh, you have much better alignment in terms of like where we're going to bring this thing. Uh, they're going to be probably more helpful, and also you know them, right? So so it's not like just someone bringing cash. It's someone who's going to bring you, uh, who's going to help you, who's going to bring advice, who's going to bring connections um, that might be useful to to the company, which should be useful to the company. Right, and you're actually walking that walk because you just raised one hundred million dollar funding, and yet you're here this week. You're at the NOAA conference. You're still meeting with. VCs and investors and, and you don't need it and that must be nice for them as well because it must it must not feel good as a VC just to get that phone call once every three years you know yeah and, 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 if I think of the time we, we invest doing that it's not again it's not like a massive investment of time right. and and by the way it's also being connected to the ecosystem um, because you know these investors actually invest in companies we partner with uh, company that you know, we might want to acquire at some stage uh, companies that actually develop uh, features that might be useful to us as a as tech platform, as marketing platform, and so on and so on. So, so it's also about like being connected and being plugged in. 
So, so today what we get from, and it's not really talking to investors for the sake of, of fundraising or, or, I mean, today clearly we're not going to fundraise anytime soon. We just closed a, a pretty massive round. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more about being connected to the community, essentially. Let's get some nuts and bolts of blah, blah, car out yeah. of the way. I have to ask you about the name. Mm -hmm. How did it happen? Um, and uh, have you ever uh, thought about different names? I think your original name was a French word and a French URL. Yeah. And then blah, blah, car. If you tell me how it happened and what that name means to people when you first tell them, you know, today. Yeah, so the, the first name uh, of the site was actually covoiturage.fr, which means essentially like ridesharing.com. Okay. So it's the French name, which is a descriptor for ride sharing, if you, if you like. And we've been using that name uh, since the early days when Fred actually started the, the, the first website. Um, uh, and essentially, we only transitioned back in 2011. Uh, so not that long ago, it was middle of 2011. Uh, and of course, the reason was you cannot scale with a French name, it makes no sense. Um, but the other one was, we, the root of the name was the chattiness index on the website. So the chattiness index was when you sign up to Black and you create your profile, obviously we ask you for lots of information like your phone number, picture, your email, uh, we verify your phone number, so we do a few checks. And then we ask you for a bio and, and a few information about yourself, like smoking, not smoking, pets, no pets. And then one of the key things is how much you talk in a car. Uh, and that's what we call the chattiness index. Okay. And you can define yourself as a blah, 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 or blah, blah, blah. Okay. All and right. that's how you talk in a car. And, and we found that it was like one of the key things people look at and, um, uh, and declare actually in their profile is how much they want to talk or not talk okay. uh, in a car. And what we realized actually when it was called covoiturage um, under the French name, and we asked people like, okay, like especially when I was traveling, I remember between Paris and, and Brussels back then, um, I was always asking my passengers, I was uh, using it as a driver, like, how did you find me? Which website have you used? And people were like, oh, I use some covoiturage something website. And, and I was like, okay, and what do you remember about the site? And they could not remember the name, they could not remember the URL, they could not remember the colors, but they remembered the blah, blah, chattiness index. Right. So we thought, okay, that's like the sticky thing. Right, this, sticky. this funky thing. Is, is actually very sticky and it sticks to people's mind. And also it, it matters to people because if you think of the activity, we end up, even though it's an online service, we end up bringing like two, three, four, five people together in a car for like three, four, five hours. Right. So you have these like human connections you create. And of course you also create potentially some social discomfort. Like, do I right. want to talk? Do I want to talk to this guy? Who's this guy? Right. So, so the chattiness index was also like a bit of an icebreaker to say, you know, if you say I'm a blah as a driver, it means, okay, I'm just gonna listen to my radio and I'm not gonna talk. And if you're a blah, 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 it means for you it's a social experiment, right? So you, you, want, to, you want to meet people. Right, I was listening to an interview with uh, the, one of the Airbnb founders. There's a class right now at Stanford called How to Start a Startup and they're podcasting it out. And, yeah. and he was saying that he spoke with one of his early uh, adopters that was you know renting his house out and he said you know there was a, a crisis I don't know what it was maybe it was uh, the tsunami or I don't know what it was maybe it was the Iceland you know volcano and he said he got six phone calls and then the next day his mother called him and he said the first six phone calls were people that had stayed at his house and so he was just impressed how it was becoming you know, like an experience and a social service. And when I when I look at blah blah car, I'm thinking, you know, you're 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 selling kind of a, an efficient way of getting a ride and using excess capacity, but you're probably building friendships. And so, is it a, a social piece? Is that something you have to address, or is that something that just takes care of itself? It's something that kind of takes care of itself, right? So, so we don't try to mandate anything. So we don't right. say, hey, you do that to meet people. We, right. we we let the community decide essentially. So in a way, I mean. Jokes aside, it, it, it's kind of the point of his blah blah index. I mean, some people just do that because they can. You know, they, they have an empty car and they want to fill up their car. Some people do that because it's a social uh, social experiment and you know, they value this social interaction. Right. And some are somewhere in the middle. Um, and you have three choices: and one blah or three blahs. Or three blahs, exactly. Okay. Right. And uh, which is, again, it's just like a signaling. So it's just right. like okay, you signal if if you're somewhere in the middle or if you, you if you don't want to talk, if you want to talk a lot. Um, but in terms of like social interaction, yeah, it's very powerful because if you think of, of the activity, there are act actually very few online activities that bring people together offline at that scale, right? Most online activities actually do the opposite. They take the offline human interactions out of the equation. Right. So it's e-commerce, so it's all these things where 
today, like I buy stuff on Amazon, boom, it gets shipped. I don't talk to, uh, don't talk to anyone essentially. Right. Two com Eventbrite comes to mind and then like Airbnb, but I can't even think of another one that pushes people yeah. to an so, offline so experience. Airbnb does that. Um, I mean, un unless you rent the whole flat, but if you rent part of the flat, boom, you're going to interact with, uh, with your host, uh, probably even bright. I mean, but there are a few that actually create that level of human connections. And in the case of black, black car, it's always going to be the case because you always, I mean, the driver and the passengers are always going to meet. You never, you never run the old car. There is always the driver uh, in the car. Right. So, so w w when you think that today we, you know, we we have like over two million people using the service every month, it means we, you know, it's like over two million human connections of on average three or four hours every right. month. So if you think this way, <laughs> it's like millions and millions of like hours of human connections we create that will not happen otherwise. And then what we ask them to do is to review each other. Right, so, so you essentially have this peer review system, okay. and what we find is, you know, unlike like uh, unlike most reviews, when you you write like a buyer or a seller on eBay, which you haven't met, so in fact you don't write the person, you write the service right. they they gave you by shipping something. Uh, here it's different. You don't write really the I mean, you write the service perhaps, but you actually you write or well, not write, but you review, or you talk about the person. So we have like you know over ten million peer to peer reviews, building trust in the community. And all these reviews, I mean, not all, but like a vast majority of these reviews have a text, right? So somebody is going to say, hey, Brian is a great guy. He's running this show and he's doing this and he's doing that. And you know, if you ride with Ryan, you should talk to him about this and this and that. And, um, and it's invaluable because you, essentially you're building this, um, this massive trust layer in our community that enables the service to grow. Right. Because you know, the more reviews we get, the more information we get about our members, um, the easier it gets for a new guy to join and say, hey, okay, now I have the choice between Brian as a driver or John or Emily, and I have like all this information about those, those drivers. And, and you might pick on price and location, but you might also pick on, okay, Brian sounds like an interesting guy and, uh, and I, I feel like I'm gonna have a nice discussion with Brian more than with John. And that information, uh, you build a database like that, that becomes really powerful. It's almost like a, a credit rating in a weird way, a personal rating. Yeah, you end, up, you end up building, in a way, you end up building like um, a, a trusted network, right. right? And today, I mean, we're talking over 10 million members and growth is accelerating. So, you know, in a few years, it might be hundreds of millions of members on BlaBlaCar on a global scale. Uh, of course, they're doing an activity, which is ride sharing, but actually we're also building this trusted community. So I, I tend to, to think of that this way, that we're building really two core assets. I mean, one is this transport network that's people powered. And then as, as you build trust in this community, there are so many other things you can do in a way. Because right. now you, you know, you, you have so much information about these members and you know like who's very active, who's like highly trusted in that community and they could do much more actually than even ride sharing in the long run. Right. So it's, it's interesting to think of it this way. It's like these two things sort of feed into each other. Right, and that's, that's the difference between a community and a marketplace you know, in a way. When did you decide that you're not gonna be a French company, you're gonna be a Euro European company? Because you've mentioned this and it is a very important distinction that I think has resulted in your growth. Yes, so, so we had like a very um, organic start as a company uh, and it, it really went back to like the origin of, um, of covoiturage of the French side it was actually when Fred um, uh, started the first website back in 2005. So it was not even incorporated as a company. So he started that as, um, uh, as a service based on his own frustration essentially of like trying to go back uh, for Christmas actually to go back to his family, he could not find a train and he thought like okay there must be something like blah blah car. And back then the, I mean it's not like you invent something like that because people have been doing that for a long time right. but there was nothing at any scale um, that was like a, an organized ride-sharing website in a way. Um, so he started to code that and then it took like um, quite some time because we, we met, so the three co-founders actually, Fred, Francis and I actually, we all met around late 2006, early 2007. That's when the company was, uh, was formed. Um, and then there was this slow phase where I went into venture capital, Fred was finishing his MBA, uh, Francis was actually still working for a, a tech company called Mythic. Um, in France, which is now Match.com, actually, so okay. it was like a, a dating okay. site. And then slowly over time, um, uh, we, we committed to, to the company. So, so Fred in 2008, France is in late 2008, early 2009, and we had the first employee in 2009. And the 2009 to 2000, I would say 11 phase, was about proving the concept, building the community in France. So it was very much a French company, right. uh, going from like first employee in 2009 to I'm going to get this wrong, but maybe like 12, 15 by sometime in 2011. 
I actually joined back the company in, in 2011. Uh, and back then, essentially, the, I mean, the, the, the French community was still pretty small, but you know, we could see usage. I mean, we, we could see like, hey, you know, people are using this thing, it's real. Um, it was not yet uh, monetized in any way, so there was essentially no revenue uh, okay. to speak of in the company. Uh, but we could see usage, we could see value being created. Uh, and then the idea, or at least my, my idea in, in coming back was, hey, no one is doing that anywhere else in Europe, pretty much. And if we wait too long, and if we spend like two or three years building this French business, actually it's only gonna be a French business. For two reasons, I mean, A, because you're gonna have competitors doing the same thing eventually in every other country. And then also when you get to a scale of like 50, 100 people in a company, changing the DNA is almost, imp I mean, it's hard. I mean, not say it's impossible, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you do it early and you say, well guys, actually, we're gonna change the game. I mean, our market is not France, it's Europe. So today we need to think of our market as being Spain plus Italy plus Germany plus UK plus Poland. So it's all these markets, that's our market. That's what we need to, to tackle now. Um, and, and the way we've... Um, which isn't a French thing to do traditionally. Which isn't a, in a weird way, which isn't a European thing oh, to do. Right. So, and, and a French thing to do either. So the countries uh, in Europe tend to focus inward. Yeah, they, they tend to focus, but, which is rational in a way. Right, because language. To, or, uh, it's language, it's, it's also more comfortable, it's also like, in a way, it's, it's a function of Europe. We all different countries with different regulations, different right. tax, different this, different that. So, so you tend to, to do like your e-commerce for Germany, your marketplace for the UK. Um, and it's something that really uh, became very obvious to me when I was in venture capital in London was, was to, to, to see that most internet companies, especially consumer internet, uh, in Europe we ended up building what I call the single country winners. So they end up winning in one country and that's it. So uh, a good example of that, I, I mean there are lots actually, but a good example is back in the, in the first wave of internet, real estate. So if you think of real estate, uh, here in the UK you have Rightmove. No one knows Rightmove outside of the UK. It's a UK only company essentially. Right. In France, you have something called Sologé. It's exactly the same thing. It's worth roughly a billion as well. Uh, great French company. No one has ever heard of this thing outside of France. In Germany, you have something called Immobilien. Same thing, worth probably a billion or so, only in Germany. Now, if you think like, okay, if someone had tackled all these markets and built this like European scale company, it would have been like a 10 billion plus company actually. Uh, and that changed the game in Europe because suddenly you, we, we would be building this sort of long-term standalone big tech company. Um, so, so I always thought like, okay, we're missing out something here, which is like, why do we build like four or five or six different companies uh, in Europe in every country as opposed to a European company? And, right. and the main issue is we don't think of our market as being Europe, right? Or at least not early enough. So we tried to, to, to inject that, um, that DNA into Blabak car. And essentially we had to do several things, right? We had to um, uh, change some of the hiring. So, so it was like hiring like international people. Right. So, so we hired people who, I mean, obviously speak good English, but also traveled around, lived in different countries. We had to build local teams. So, so it was like my strong belief was the way you tackle Germany or Spain is by having a team on the ground with okay. Spanish people. Which means acquisition potentially? Which means also acquisitions. Okay. So, so it was like the way you do that is you either hire, or actually you acquire, or right. acquire hire, I should right. say. Uh, and then you find these great teams and you say, hey, join us and be part of the adventure and you're gonna be Black Black Art Spain and you're gonna be Black Black, Black Art Germany. And we've done that, right? So, so we've done that in, uh, in Italy and Germany, uh, which was one acquisition, actually a German guy. Uh, we started Italy and then uh, we started uh, Germany together. We've done that in Poland, we've done that in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so, so a big chunk of Black Black Art today is the product of like some of these acquisitions. Okay. Uh, so, so that's how we've built the footprint um, all over Europe and even Russia today. Um, and then of course the other thing we had to do was fundraising. Because you know, very quickly you, you start building this firepower where you say, okay, we're going to launch all these countries at once, or well, not at once, but uh, you know, pretty, pretty rapidly, uh, and then you need to fundraise. And, and it was probably the, the, the toughest, well, not the toughest, but the, yeah, it was kind of a tough fundraising it was, um, it was back in December 2011 when we closed 10 million with Excel. Because Axel actually backed um, you very much a vision of we can become European, but nothing was proven, right? So, okay. so essentially, like they came in thinking, okay, we think you guys are the right team. We, you know, we believe the we believe the vision. We think you execute pretty well. Uh, go for it with ten million. Uh, and then we continued toward toward that thinking of like, okay, we need to we need to become a European company, i.e., our market needs to be Europe. 
And that's a game changer because it, when, when you manage to do that, which I think we, we are in the process of doing, I mean, today we, we leader pretty much in every market in Europe with Blah Blah Car, so, which is pretty unusual for European companies. Then you end up changing uh, scale completely and you can say, well, now we're going to tackle the rest of the world, but not from being a French company, from having Europe as our footprint. Okay. Uh, and I remember like when we raised the, um, the $100 million, which is essentially like, the same story, but you know, France to Europe became Europe to global. Okay. Um, I remember, like, I had this meeting in Silicon Valley with um, a pretty well-known um, investor, and and I was asking him, like, okay, would you uh, you would you invest in a French company? Uh, you know, is that a problem for for you? You know, given you're in Silicon Valley and you tend to invest a lot in, in the U.S. and in Silicon Valley, and and I had this slide actually uh, as we were talking, which was just like. You know, like one slide of the deck I was showing him, where you had like essentially a map of, of the world and with like all the countries where we, we are and all the countries where we're going to with dates. Uh, and, and he turned to the, to the slide and he told me, well, look, you know, when I look at, uh, at this, I mean, I think of you guys, you're just a global company that, ends, uh, that happens to be HQ'd in Paris. And I don't care about that because what I care about is that you're a global company. So, you know, that's interesting. It means you can shift the paradigm as you know, people don't see you as being a French or a German or a this or that company. You know, Vesua says, okay, we, we're a global company. But you had to have that success in Europe first for probably the credibility to, to say that you could go global and for, I guess, the whole culture. And yeah, the, the exactly. Because I think if you've only proven France, let's say, or Germany or whatever, wherever you start from, and then you go and you say, we, now we're going to go global, people are going to be, well, okay, but your, your initial footprint what you've what you've proven so far is actually quite tiny. Right. Whereas if you if you've proven Europe, in a way, if you're a U.S. company, if you have the U.S. market, which is uh, as big as Europe, as Europe, if not bigger, then of course you can use that as a platform to say, now I'm going to go global. So to go global, you need Europe as a platform. Right, but that's a quite a pioneering way of going about it. As in, there's not a real history of doing it that way. And America is something that always comes up on this show. And funny enough, we've had people like Damian Kimmelman of Do Dill and recently uh, Nick Hungerford of, uh, of uh, Nutmeg who are in no rush to get to America. You know, they see the size of the markets in the UK and then the regulation issues in America and they're not in a rush to go over there. And then we got people like Y Plan that see it as a very necessary step to go right away. So what is your time frame for America? And you're obviously not in a rush because mm -hmm. you've got a lot of other things to do. You mentioned you just went into Turkey a week ago. That's pretty exciting. Um, are you not in a rush? No, I think right now we're not. And, 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 and I think it's even beyond that. I mean, we, we raised this round um, uh, essentially being pretty clear that it was not to go to the U.S. Okay. So it doesn't mean we'll never go to the U.S., but, but you know, essentially it was not... And it's interesting because you see lots of people saying that essentially if you raise that kind of money, it's for a U.S. plan. But in our case, it's not. Right. Uh, and it's very interesting because it means it's possible to. And it means like the, uh, the mindset has changed. So today if you say... And again, it's back to, to what we talked about. If you say, well, actually, we own Europe, and that's pretty big as a market, especially for what we do, transport. You know, it's a very big market. Um, and then if you say, well, look at Russia, look at India, let's look at Latam, let's look at Turkey, those are huge markets too. So people see that as, okay, you have a global play. Uh, you, you're building like this global transport network. Um, if you come to the U.S., great. If you don't, that's fine too. Yeah, it's a bit surprising when you see European companies saying, well, actually, I need to go to the U.S. because 80% of my market is in, the, is in the U.S., then you almost think like, well, okay, reincorporate in the U.S. and right. maybe you started on the wrong side of the pond. Right. Travel and leisure actually in Europe is maybe a bigger market yeah. than, uh, than the U.S. Talk to me about France. Um, we had Roxanne Varza in here six, eight months ago, yeah. but you're the second person, I think, that's French that's been on this show. That could be our fault. And when we hear about tech startups, everyone talks about Rocket in Berlin, and we talk about you know, the, the Nordic countries. But you know, it's, it's, it's not something that we always have seen France promote, whether it's a startup business or tech startup. You have an intimate knowledge of that. What's it feel like being in Paris? Are you, uh, uh, you guys are probably one of the biggest stories there, one of the biggest pioneers. And it, does France get a bad rap when it comes to the impression of startup? Yeah, I, I think it's a lot of bad communication at the, at the government level to some extent. So, so especially about taxes and so on. I mean, every time, um, every time the French government um, communicates around taxes, it's a disaster. And, and when you read... It's always bad news when they talk about taxes. Well, in fact, it, it, it's actually... It is, I mean, yeah, it tends to be bad news, if I'm honest, but, uh, but beyond that, it, it's not just, it's the way it's communicated is pretty poor, 
right? So it's always like, it's actually, it's always poorly communicated. And, um, uh, and then you end up with these stories um, in English speaking newspapers that give the impression that essentially it's like horrible, impossible to grow and do, do business in France, which in reality is not quite true, right? So, so in reality, it's actually not that bad. Uh, and especially like starting a company in France is not that bad because you get quite a few subsidies, you get some help uh, from, from, from the government. So actually, you know, they'd better communicate on that, but communicate on like high tax brackets, right? Okay. Because that's what gets picked up by the, uh, by the media when in fact the environment is, is not that bad, right? Okay. It's not that bad at all. Um, and in terms of companies, you know, it's, it's funny, um, we, we share um, our office with Criteo, uh, right. and, and Criteo, you were talking about French success, actually. Did Index uh, invest in them as well? Index is also an investor, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's a company that IPO'd, um, I think, a year ago. It doesn't get talked about enough. That it's company. a B2B business, so, so it's right. not as, I mean, Babacar being so, such a consumer uh, internet company, right. uh, lots of people know Babacar, the brand awareness of Babacar is massive, whereas Criteo is a B2B business, right? So no one knows Criteo, right. but that's a big company. I mean, you're talking, I, mean, I don't know how many employees they have, but it must be in the thousand. Um, it's a company worth uh, a few billions actually uh, on NASDAQ today. So it's a big French success. Right. And, and even like at the scale of Europe, they have, there are not many companies uh, of that scale in Europe today. So you have like maybe Spotify and a few others. Um, so there are some companies coming out of France, um, not enough. Uh, not enough at like super high scale. Um, but again, it's about, you know, if you look at Criteo, what they've done well again, expansion. So I think that's kind of the key. It's like, and whether it's like French companies or German companies or British companies, it's like, how do we tackle the European market or how do we tackle the bigger market from European countries? Right. Talk to me about company culture. Uh, uh, there was a quote that said, blah, blah, car is like a rocket internet company with a teddy bear at the top of the company. Um, you're known for having really highly motivated people, yeah. really focused on what you do, really passionate people. Is that, I mean, that comes from the top, comes from you guys. Is that something, I mean, you obviously spent time in Silicon Valley where culture is, is such a big part of it. Is that something you made a real distinction of early on that we're going to do certain things this way or we're going to have things yeah. feel this way? Is it something you're proud of? I mean, yeah, for sure. It, it, it's, something we, it's something we as a founding team and we as a company are proud of. Uh, I think it comes from two things. It comes from the activity itself, actually. So, so if you think of the nature of the activity, our members uh, are pretty proud because you know, they do something that makes sense. So you have this feeling of like participating in something good. Right. Like you're sharing your car with other people. Uh, so of course, not only you make money or you save money because you know, we're building this low cost transport network, but you also participate in something that makes sense from a social sense, makes sense from, for the environment. Right. Uh, you know, we increase car occupancy massively. Right? Black, black car is like 2.7 people per car as opposed to 1.5 on average in Europe. Uh, and of course, if you do that, you know, if, if you have that as, um, as a community, you, it goes back up into your employees and, uh, yeah. and the funding team. So, so that's something that matters to us, right? So it's just building this, um, this very collaborative, um, uh, trusting and sharing culture within the company. Um, so uh, you know, uh, Fred, Francis and I actually spend a lot of time doing that essentially. And, uh, and not just us, it's even all the managers we have in the company spend a lot of time like yeah, maintaining that culture, which is a challenge actually as you grow, right? Because especially as you grow the way we grow in many countries with local teams yeah. and even through acquisition, it's like, okay, how do you preserve culture? How do you? How do you do that so, in, in Poland or in Russia? Or yeah, yeah. So, so we do. It's a very good question, actually. So the, 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 the way we do that is by, um, so different level, actually. To a first level, we do that by maintaining the brand and the value of the service across these countries. So we never went into having different brand names in different countries, right? So, so it's all blah, blah, car, right? It's all okay. the same service and so on, which helps, right? Because it means the same values, the same feeling, the same site, the same service, the same communication to same marketing, you know, everything is pretty consistent across the board, again, at the, at the community level. And then at the, at the employee level, um, what we do is we bring back at least like all the country managers every six weeks to, uh, to HQ, so to Paris, uh, for at least a week and we synchronize, right? Okay. So essentially we spend a lot of time like talking about the strategy, talking about the next step for each country. And to do that, we've built uh, some central teams, which are actually based most in Paris, but a bit between Paris and London, actually. Uh, so we have a growth team, which focuses like, how do we grow um, the activity in every country? 
uh, we have a communication team, which is about like how do we communicate the activity and how do we communicate in general across all these countries. Um, uh, we have a brand and marketing team, which is like how do we preserve the brand in all these countries. And then we have a new business team, which is about like how do we launch new countries. So those are sort of the, the central pillars. And then you have all these local teams, and now we have nine, and at some point we'll have like maybe 15 or 20, um, essentially managing the whole countries. Uh, so, so it's really interesting because the fact that you bring people back together pretty often um, uh, and that we travel, these central teams actually travel a lot. So we have people actually traveling a lot, in, 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 so it's, it's, a big, it's a big investment in a way. Uh, and then it's lots of small things like we have a company meeting every week where it's not just like, I mean, actually it's not us, the, the founding team talking, it's actually, it's actually every team is going to go one after the other uh, week after week and they present to the rest of the company. And we've set up like a, a video cast where it's, it's actually broadcasted to all the offices. Mm. So it's half an hour every week, and you know, everybody's watching that and everybody gets an update on what's going on with product, what's going on with customer service team, what's going on with the new business team. We actually allow people to go spend a week um, uh, in any office they want for what, I mean, for no reason, I mean, not, not like a business trip. So if they want to go and spend a week in Milan and work a week for Milan, we sponsor that, right? So, and, and the idea here is that a developer in Paris is going to go spend a week working with the Italian team or the Russian team. And then when he comes back, he's going to realize, ah, okay, now I understand the challenge of his team. I understand what they're trying to do in Russia and it's different from what I'm seeing in France, for example. And then you become like probably a smarter developer because you start to understand like, okay, I'm part of a global company and, uh, and I need to help these guys. Right. And, and you realize that, okay, maybe their community is younger than our community in, um, in, in XYZ country. So we cross-pollinate a lot. Okay. Right? So and culture is essential for your success. I think it's essential to any company's success yeah. in the long run, right? So, so if you don't keep um, values and culture as you grow, it becomes disjointed, right? So, so today we invest a lot on that, right? Right. And people, employees need much more than a value proposition. The, the, the great companies really think they're changing the world, you know, especially the marketplace companies like Uber and Airbnb. I mean, they think they're providing something that's you know changing people's lives and i'm, I'm yeah. guessing it's the same with you i think it's, i think it's the same uh, for most of our employees i mean they don't feel and i think frankly they don't feel they work for a company i think they're part of a movement right. and again like also they uh, most of them i guess are very proud to work for something like bye bye car because again it's it's meaningful you, you can talk to your friend and say well here's what we're doing and here's how fast it's growing and here is the impact so it's not like working for your, uh, your average company. Right. Well, you've done your job. Um, what can you learn from uh, Uber and Airbnb? I mean, they're, I know your, your service is different because uh, you actually create demand, which is kind of fascinating about what you do. You know, when you offer up these routes that previously weren't available, all of a sudden, you know, people take those routes, which is kind of fascinating and different. But what, what have you learned by watching them both scale and, you know, different ways to attack a marketplace, different things not to do? Or have you not learned anything? Or you go a completely different company? So Uber, I mean, clearly what's been fascinating to watch, but probably, probably two things actually. One is scaling speed, which is phenomenal. Yeah. Phenomenal. And 250 cities or something? 250 cities in a very short time. So you know, if I look at that, I'm like, wow, right? From, from the yeah. uh, scaling point of view. Impressed, how did they do it, right? Yeah, okay. and I think they impress every company varies. I mean, I, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's uh, the fastest company ever, but probably pretty close. Yeah. Um, so there's something impressive here. Um, the, the, the other thing about Uber is obviously the regulation challenge, um, which for us is very different though, right? So we don't have that regulation challenge at all. Okay. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see how Uber is tackling that issue being so frontal uh, with regulators. For us, it's never been an issue uh, and probably less so than Uber or Airbnb because the old paradigm of black car is around cost sharing and sharing a ride you would do anyway. Talk to me about safety. Is it an issue that comes up? I guess it's probably a glaring thing people ask right away. Is it safe to ride in the cars with strangers? I don't know if you offer a service for women only or if that's something you're looking at. I can see why there's demand, but I can see why there's demand for a lot of different marketplaces like that. Um, what do you say to people when they ask you and has it been an issue? Yeah, so, so obviously it's core to what we do, right? So, right. so, so trust and safety is core to what we do. And, and again, like, you know, if you think of, again, the assets we create, so this transport network and this trusted community, it's a trusted community. So trust is, is very much there. And um, so what we end up doing, and then I'll, I'll go into some more details, but it's like verifications. 
So, so we end up verifying things about our members, whether it's like they, I mean, essentially you cannot sign up to the service without verifying your mobile phone. So every account is linked to a mobile phone. Um, in some countries, you can only Facebook connect uh, to the service, like Turkey, for example. Okay. Uh, increasingly, we're doing that. Um, and then over time, actually, we built a lot more. So you, we ask you for your bio, um, uh, we verify your bank account when you get a payment in countries where we enable payment. Um, so we do lots of verifications. So you have like a strong verification block essentially. And then the other one, which is very powerful, is it's peer reviews, right? So we allow people to rate each other. So over time, actually, we built lots of information, verification and knowledge and peer review and self-regulation within the community uh, to, 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 to essentially enable trust. The other thing we do is we have like a ladies only feature. So uh, you know, if, you, if you want only to have like female passengers as a female driver, you can, uh, and, and same thing as a passenger. Um, increasingly, you can see also who booked in the car. So for example, if you're a female passenger and you see that actually in the car you already have uh, you're, uh, a male passenger and a, male, uh, and a female passenger and you're gonna be the third person, you probably feel more comfortable if okay. it's the first time you use the service. So it's all these things actually help okay. building trust. Uh, and last but not least, we have, um, we have a customer service team um, essentially almost pretty much 24 seven, uh, you know, that help people run, uh, answer to ticket, re reply to alerts, uh, and, and, and things like that. Right. So, so it's something we take very seriously as we should, because that's what powers the rest, right? So it's like yeah. building this trusted community, uh, in the long run, that's going to power blah, that cars, a transport network, or maybe something else in the future. Right. What's next for you? You know, you're, you're the COO, the next 12 months, are you, are you shooting for profitability at some point? Do you kind of look at that by local markets or what are your big milestones coming up? Yeah, so it's really, I mean, t today I would say it's two things. It's global and mobile. So, so it's really getting into this global um, uh, footprint. So, so we're super excited by markets like Russia, who's been the fastest growing market we've had since the beginning. Really? So Why? I, I, I think what we do in, in, in countries like Russia, but I think we'll see like also Turkey, like maybe India even more, um, uh, Latin America, uh, it's more fundamental than what we've been doing in Europe. Because in Europe, actually, the transport infrastructure is pretty good. It's expensive, it's old, but it's pretty good. Right. And it's there, right? And, uh, and I would say it's in adequation with the demand. In countries like Russia or uh, probably even more Turkey and, uh, and India, we we not yet, uh, but we plan. You know, we we very keen on India, and we, we, we plan to go in the in the near future. You know, the, the the infrastructure is actually not that good. Like it's not like you have great trains in those countries. It's not like you have right right anything really. Right, it's um, technology from thirty years ago. Yeah, it, it, and it hasn't scaled uh, with demand. Right, so okay, so right. sometimes it's just like it's fully booked and uh, and you. Like and that's I, it. We'll come back I, later. And I hear that story a lot in Turkey. I've heard the story in India. Um, in Turkey, we launched before a big weekend, actually, in Turkey. And the biggest issue people had was not even like price or anything like that. It was they could not book a bus ticket anymore. It was too late. Everything was fully booked. Hmm. So by doing that, we enable, we create this additional supply, which is very, very good because, you know, you, you end up like riding in a car, which is faster than riding in a bus. It's cheaper than the bus and it's available. Right. So uh, wins across so the board. You, wins across yeah, the board. You love those businesses, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great so so it's like, you know, if you look at like, uh, whereas in Europe, you know, if, if you look at um, uh, like a train, for example, yeah, we're not going to go faster than the German trains or the French trains. But, but back to, um, to emerging markets, I think there is a huge play for us there. So it's going to be one of the focus for you for the, I don't know, like one, two, three years ahead. Uh, and the other thing is we're launching these markets just on mobile, right? So, so Turkey is just on mobile. Hmm. Um, so today we're also shifting because we've always we were grown from... Um, from desktop, so we have both, right? So we have we have usage on both. Uh, right now, all these new markets, it's going to be hundred percent mobile. Wow! So so it's like a shift also of like it's a double shift of, of DNA. It's like now we are a global company, and by the way, the only product we're going to launch in these markets is a mobile app. Is that is that pushing from the top, saying if we can own this in mobile, that's where the market's going anyways. So let's not try to hedge our bets. Let's yeah, just to, go. Do you mean it's like yeah? Well, so, or is so, that a necessity in emerging markets where the mo the marketplace is mobile only? It's in fact both because you know, if, if you look at, um, at usage in these markets, um, it's gone mobile actually even faster than Europe or the US you know, because they almost skipped uh, to some extent like desktop. Uh, and today, like forcing yourself to say, well, now that's all we have in these markets. We're going to launch Bebecars, 100% mobile app. 
um, in, in these markets. Scary, a little scary. It's a little scary, but it forces you uh, as a company to actually innovate on mobile. Yeah. And, and suddenly you, you break the circle of, of like you being in your comfort zone of thinking like, okay, the, we need to develop the, the desktop features. And at the end, if you become really good at something, the, the danger is that you stay there. Yeah. Right, because you, you, it's your comfort zone. Yeah, innovator's dilemma, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. In reverse, so, right? so, so, so in a way, I'm, I'm kind of using right now emerging markets to say it's 100% mobile, and then suddenly as the usage is growing on these markets, of course it flows back into the old tech and product team and so on, which is like suddenly it's like, oh, we need to be, uh, we need to be better at like building a product for mobile. We need to be better at marketing on mobile. We need to be better at like getting users and acquisition channels on mobile. So all these things tend to to follow, and, and I hope like, you know, in a year, uh, when we develop something, we'll think, okay, we, it's just mobile. Oh, by the way, we need to do desktop as well. Right. I exaggerate, but, right. but, but that's what you want, essentially. And it's, a cha- and it's a risk for us to be, in, in the long run, to be, to be stuck to, to a desktop application for too long. And, and the danger is that there is like lots of platform stickiness, in a way. So, so if people discovered uh, something on desktop, even though you have a great mobile app, they might not try it because they have the same comfort of like, oh, okay, I've been using Expedia yeah. on desktop for a long time, yeah. uh, or Booking.com on desktop for a long yeah. time. Comes Hotel Tonight yeah. on, on a mobile app, yeah. bang, I'm going ch- to switch to a new, a new usage. You, you can lose people because they see that as, oh, okay, I'm, gonna, like, I, I'm not going to use the same thing on my phone as I was using on my right. desktop. It almost has a legacy issue. I feel that with Amazon. I'm still more comfortable buying Amazon on my desktop because I think I learned it that way. So I'm, I know it's not exactly what you're talking about, but it's like I'm less likely to use their, their app because I'm not yeah. used to it. Mobile enables actually more features. It's location aware, it's lots of things, yeah. right? Uh, it knows lots of things about you actually on your phone, by the way, yeah. which your desktop doesn't know. If you think of it, like a, a desktop is pretty clueless about who you are compared to a phone. Right, it has cookies and, and IPs, but it doesn't have a whole wealth of other information. Yeah. So you shouldn't look at it as a limit, you should look at yeah. it as new so, so you can, you can do something a lot more personal uh, on, a, on a phone than you can do on a desktop. Profitability, is that something that's on your mind? Is that something no. where you would like to get there? Eventually. <laughs> You'd see a little, I hope so. <laughs> so it, 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 eventually we want the business to, be, uh, to, to make sense. Uh, no, today not at all actually to be, to, to be, to be clear because today it's about, uh, it's about growing the footprint. Um, uh, so so to, to, today we, you know, we, we choose not to be profitable, we choose to grow the footprint. Um, I guess what's important, as I was saying earlier, is to, to make sure your unit economics actually makes sense. Um, uh, and then if you realize that, okay, my unit economics makes sense, makes sense once I monetize or once I activate my business model, um, then it's, in my mind, it's, it's okay to fundraise and scale uh, because you know long, long term you're building value and you're building something that's, that can be profitable in the long run. Today, essentially, if we were, if our choice was to be profitable today, we would be missing out on something much bigger, and right. much bigger for the company, but also much bigger for society, much bigger for how we can change transport and the way people travel on a global scale. So today, if you want to do uh, your Russia and Turkey and Latin America and India, uh, all of that at the same time, um, of course, the trade-off is you fundraise, you don't become profitable, you build this massive usage and massive um, transport network, and then over time, you rationalize that as a as a business. Right, and you have the capital, so you have the luxury of making that decision, and that's the most intelligent decision. Yeah, yeah, right. and that's the point of the fundraising. Right, right, right. I always ask everyone that comes on here a couple questions at the end. I'm gonna ask you, um, if you could make a, a phone call to the 20-year-old Nicholas and give that young man a bit of advice, I'm guessing you were still in France or you hadn't gone to, to California yet, uh, what would you tell him? Uh, to the 20-year-old Nicholas, oh my God. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. So 20 year old, I knew nothing about startups and I was, uh, I was studying physics. Uh, Were you entrepreneurial? No. At all? No, no, no. Interesting. Okay. No, I was, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting because if I think of it, it's, uh, I, I don't know if I would change, I mean, you, I would change plenty of things, right? But, but at the end, I tend not to look back so much. So, because you cannot change the past. Yeah. Right? I tend to look at like, what are we gonna do for the next five years more than, what I could have done differently in the last 15. Um, so, so back then, I mean, it was like, you know, my life was science and physics. 
And, and in a way, and that's a background we share with Fred, actually we both have a physics background. And it's interesting because I think the way we think still today, in terms of like these communities and these big numbers and, and so on, is very much like, like physicist. Like you think of that as like, it's not really math because it's not like absolute reality, absolute numbers. It's more like you try to model um, people' behavior, right? Uh, like applied physics. Yeah, it's applied physics, right? right? Yeah, so, yeah. so, so it's like it, because it's actually it's like people often ask us like, how do you know uh, it's going to work in a market? Or it's not going to work in a market, and and what we do is we do this rational analysis of. Um, you know, have cars and what's the price of petrol and what's the cost of transport. But there is the, the, the old aspect, which is like culturally, is it gonna is it gonna work or not, and how people behave, uh, and that's more like touch. I mean, it's more like physics, where you know, when you you launch, you essentially you launch your activity, you launch your service, and then you see how people interact. How do they contact each other? Do they call each other? Do they message? How do they review each other? Uh, how do we make sure like when people have, have spent two or three or four hours together? They're comfortable reviewing each other, and and you, you kind of try to model that into into a product that makes sense, and in a way it's a bit of physics skills, right? Mm. It's a bit like the, the way you model uh, how is like a camera working, how is something falling on the floor, and you you essentially there's no, um, it's not like pure math. It's just like modeling right. something, right? And, and 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 we think of the uh, of the business a bit like that. So and you have wonderful data, right? And so I guess I'm glad I'm glad I studied physics, and then <laughs> and then you. Know, the, the, the way I get into, uh, into startup is, uh, frankly, it's a bit of luck. It, it, I mean, it's a bit of like, there's a bit of like a random path. If I think of luck, I mean, we, uh, you know, 2007, actually, there was this massive strike, actually, in France. So, like, one of the biggest train strike in history. Um, and guess what happened? Like, lots of people actually discovered for the first time Blabla car, which was not called Blabla car. But for the first time, we could see the light. We could see, like, ooh, people are using this service. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, in 2010, I think it was, uh, there was the ash cloud. You talked yeah, about the ash cloud yeah, earlier. Ash cloud, yeah. All the um, air traffic actually was was stopped for like a week, I think. Yeah. Something like that. Right? It was massive. And then for the, it was like a huge spike of activity and PR for us all over Europe because people were stranded. So trains were full. So people were actually helping each other with cars. Right. And, uh, and people were like, we've seen some Madrid to Paris. We've seen people like, like, like a massive peak of activity. It was almost hard to, to maintain the servers actually back then. Um, and like, again, it's this like kind of lucky event that sort of triggered the marketplace in the early days. Of course, now it's different. We have money, we have recipes, we, we understand how to educate the market. But back then, frankly, it was 2007 and even 2010, we had almost no money. So yeah, hash cloud to kickstart your activity was right. a bit these, of luck. Were, these were lucky events in the creation. Yeah, it's of lucky event. Second part of that question is best advice you've ever received, business or personal, in your career. Those are hard questions. I wish I had prepared. Huh? It's better uh, when you don't, because you, you <laughs> receive so many advice, and sometimes you don't realize the the advice. Uh, I, I, I mean, one I mentioned was yeah, in, in the early days, it was um, well, actually, one of the best advice was I, I remember like when I was working in. Um, in, in venture capital with Erman Hauser, uh, who's, uh, who's a very emblematic figure actually in the um, in UK uh, venture capital. He was the founder of Acorn, which was the, okay. the UK Apple, and then ARM, which is process, like the, the, yeah. the, the processors uh, we use in every phone. And every time we, we, we saw companies, you, you had these entrepreneurs saying, um, oh, yeah, my exit strategy is going to be something, something, something. Like I'm going to sell to eBay, or I'm going to be acquired by this and that. And Herman is always like, don't worry about your exit strategy or you know, don't, don't worry about this thing. Just keep growing 100% year on year and something good is going to happen. <laughs> and, and, and I think it was the best advice he was giving to these guys. That's a good and, advice. And, um, and when people ask us, I, I really repeat that because I believe it's true. It's like, you know what, focus on like growth, expanding, building a great service and growing fast. Uh, and then like you, essentially something good is going to happen. Last part of that question is to the 20-year-old that's out there listening to us uh, that could be living in one of the markets you're about to enter or uh, Turkey, Brazil, or some of these other, India. Um, what advice do you give to them if they want to have a career like you? You know, if they want to, you know, start from non-tech or non-entrepreneurial and become to grow to one day be the COO of a company like Blah Blah Car, what would you tell them? Uh, I, I would think t today the environment has changed, especially in Europe, right? So if we talk about like European entrepreneurs, I mean, today you have like first, I mean, sorry, second or third generation actually entrepreneurs. So you have people that you know, started companies in, uh, in the 2000 era, they started companies like us. Right. So, so, so I would say like get mentorship. 
and, and you can do it in two ways. I mean, A, you can do it by get a bit of angel investment from, from guys who've done it before, uh, or even go, go work for these companies actually for a few years and see like what they're doing well, what they're not doing well, how they structured the company. Um, and, and maybe just doing that for a few years is gonna teach you a lot when you start your company. So you know, if you're just out of school, I mean, obviously you have these like complete outliers like the Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates, which yeah. don't even finish their studies and they build these incredible companies. Right. But I think there is this study actually showing that the statistically the most successful entrepreneurs tend to be in their 30s, like early 30s okay. when they start their company, Interesting. which is essentially means, yeah, they've been working for like five, 10 years. So they've been seeing a bit or quite a bit. Um, but they still have hunger, right? So they're not, they're not like 50 year old and thinking like, oh yeah, I'm gonna retire pretty soon. Um, so I think it's, a, it's a, you know, uh, to me a good advice would be, hey, maybe work for some of the best companies out there growing fast, see how they're doing, see what they're doing well, not well, get mentorship from you know, the founders or exec teams or some of the, uh, the employees that have been there from day one or you know, from, from the early days, um, learn from that and then maybe start your company. Yeah, yeah, I'm always a little suspicious when people kind of start a startup straight out of university and I always think, you know, there's just so much you can glean from being around mentors or whether they're formal or not, or even, you know, I, I used to, you know, slam my previous career in banking, but I even think even a big company, you can learn a lot for a couple of years just to see how things can be run. Um, I think the best advice is to just go do something. Yeah, so. and at least for me, it was my path. I mean, I, yeah, like, like seven years in Silicon Valley was, uh, you're being involved in like different stage. I mean, I've seen a company from 35 to 150, down to 10, to 10, to back to 150. So you see these phases of growth, right? Yeah. So, you, so you, you see like from like raising crazy, crazy rounds and money doesn't matter to chapter 11 and not paying ourselves. Um, I learned a lot. And then I learned in venture capital, um, which is very interesting too. Um, especially if you've done actually seven years of like being an operator uh, in a startup and then you, you, you jump into venture capital. Because then again, you end up seeing from a different perspective, a different prism, you, I mean, from the board essentially, you end up seeing lots of companies at different stage. Yeah, it's quite. A, it's like a perfect CV for what you're doing now. So I guess that's why you're here, um, Nicholas. Thanks so much for the time. Um, I appreciate it. If people want to uh, to uh, uh, look for a job with you, or if they just want to get get on Blah Blah Car, what's the best way for them to do it? So it's all on the website, right? So you, so you go to blahblahcar.com, and and we have like you know, websites for every country. And I don't know how many job openings we have, but Tons. Plenty. In every okay. country. Right. And uh, if you're in uh, Turkey, go straight to the mobile, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. Just download the app. Go right to the app. Fantastic. It's a great story. Now I understand why, uh, you know, Index is backing you was so big. And it's interesting, you know, uh, other marketplace companies, you know, have a lot of press surrounding them. And I think yours now is just really bubbling and, and getting there because it took me a while to understand exactly what, what's unique about you guys. But it, it's definitely something special. And um, I, I see kind of real potential for exponential growth, which I guess you do too. So um, thanks so much for being here. As we say on uh, Silicon Reel, it's about the people and uh, wish all the best. Come back in a few years and let us know how you're doing. Sounds good. Thank all you. Right. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Cool.